are rooted in corporate values. Conference, give a big round of applause for Lisa and Andy. Wow, look at this. A party that has got its confidence back and its eye on the prize. It is really great to be here with you today. And amazing to follow Abigail um, and to be here in the city that she is so proud of, even if it is on the wrong side of the Pennines. <laughs> oh God, I've lost the room already. Um, it's, a, it's an amazing city, Leeds, and one that is quite dear to my heart. A city of survivors like Liz Truss who survived the terrible experience of attending one of the best comprehensive schools in the country and went on to achieve her dream of becoming Prime Minister and crashing the economy. Well done, Liz. Let's hear it for Liz Truss. But actually, Leeds is important to me for another reason. And although I think Abigail probably tried very hard to find a Leeds connection for me, there is one. My dad came to this city in the 1950s to study under an incredible literary professor, Arnold Kettle, at Leeds University. It was a deliberate choice. He chose to turn down places at Oxford, at the LSE, and at universities all over the world and come and make his home in this country because of the fantastic education that was on offer in Leeds. He spent three of the happiest years of his life here. He says it was bar none the best time that he's ever had. I suspect that was more to do with the cricket, frankly, than the university. But he left with a top class degree and he went on to help write the Race Relations Act, one of the greatest gifts that Labour's ever given to this country. And that, so I was reflecting not only on how deeply offensive it is to have a prime minister that trashes all of that in the name of personal progress, but also on the way here, I was reflecting on the challenges that his generation had to face and to face down and the challenges that now fall to all of us. We've had a dark, divisive decade, 12 long years of Tory rule. It's left us with stagnant wages, soaring energy bills, rising food prices, crumbling public services that have been cut to the bone. And then just when you thought it couldn't get any worse, along comes Liz Truss and Kwasi Kwarteng, the arsonists alliance who poured fuel on the fire and set fire to our economy. It's their reckless gamble with unfunded borrowing that has created a crisis for homeowners across this country. 1.8 million people facing the prospects of an average hike in their mortgage costs of £500 every month in every region of this country. Young people who've scrimped and saved for a deposit, watching their dreams of home ownership and security vanish before their eyes. We're staring down the barrel of the hardest winter that most people can imagine. And Bobby Kennedy once said, there's another kind of violence, more deadly destructive than the shot or the bomb in the night. This is the slow destruction of a child by hunger and schools without books and homes without heat in the winter. Welcome to Tory Britain, a country where so many people face the prospect of that winter all these decades later. And we should never stop reminding people that this was not inevitable. It was a choice. It was an unforgivable and avoidable act of national self-harm that has crashed our economy and left working people paying the price. A Tory crisis created in Downing Street, paid for by working people in every part of our country. Now, the Prime Minister has now popped up to tell us that the answer to this is growth. She says she wants growth, growth, growth. It's a good line. It was a good line back in June when Rachel Reeves and Keir Starmer said it. <laughs> but that's the point. Everybody knows that we need growth in our economy because 12 years of a Tory government have left us, as Rachel says, with low growth and high taxes in an endless spiral of decline. But we know that the reason that we need growth is because it's the only way that we get money back into people's pockets and get them spending again on high streets and in local businesses so that we can rebuild our public services and bring this country together to face the future. The problem, though, is that for Liz Truss, 
is that there's been one constant over these 12 years of low growth, and that's Liz Truss. The one person who sat in every cabinet under Cameron, May and Johnson that have delivered over a decade of stagnation. There is an anti-growth coalition. The problem for the Prime Minister is that it's the Tory party and she is the leader of it. So never let her get away with talk of opportunity and jobs and unleashing Britain's potential. Every tired idea that they've unveiled in the last few weeks, they've tried before and failed. And what has become crashingly obvious is that this is growth by the few for the few. Well, we say it's different. We say it takes a nation. We say it is only by all of us working together, all people and all places, that we can rebuild this country. And rebuilding this country is the task that falls to our generation. That is what confronts us now. The foundations of a decent, secure life have been slowly eroded. We have an economy we work hard for every day, but doesn't work for us. The contribution of most people and most places has been written off and written out of our national story. And in towns across the country like mine in Wigan, people feel this very, very keenly. Towns that were once the engine room of British industry, with work that gave pride and purpose, we understood the contribution that we made to Britain. But over recent decades, those opportunities have been taken from us. So too many young people in places like Wigan and Stoke, I can see Ruth Smith and Gareth Snell sitting in the audience, who've been fighting for their town over a very long period of time. Too many of those young people, like the ones I met with Ruth and Gareth recently, tell us they have to get out to get on. And they take with them the spending power that sustains our high streets and our pubs and our post office and our banks and our bus services commissioned on the basis of passenger numbers. So too many people are left growing old hundreds of miles away from children and from grandchildren. And our cities where they move to are plagued by soaring housing costs and huge extremes of inequality and wealth, air pollution and strain on public services. We just cannot continue to power a modern economy using only a handful of people in a handful of sectors in one small corner of the country. And the reason that I believe this, and I believe it with all my heart, is because I believe that the great untapped asset that we have in this country is people. That's what the Tories will never understand, but it's what those of you in this room, it's what Joe and the co-op party have always known. 50 years ago, the great trade unionist Jimmy Reid went to give a speech to students at Glasgow University. And he said, I am convinced that the great mass of our people go through life without even a glimmer of what they could have contributed. But the great untapped assets of the North Sea are as nothing compared to the great untapped assets of our people. And that is not just a personal tragedy, it is a social crime. Now he could have been speaking those words today you in this room have always known it, that one person alone is never enough. Change, real change, comes from all of us, bubbling up from the ground up, pulling together to build and create in it for the long haul. And you're right. That's why I've come here today to tell you that people are going to be at the heart of Labour's plan to build the country that I've believed in all of my life, but never quite yet seen. A country where everybody has the right to contribute and has a stake in the future and shares in the proceeds of our growth. So we're going to tilt the balance of power back towards those people, the real wealth creators, the women and the men who work in our shops and who drive our buses, who deliver our mail, who produce our food, who care for our families and who teach our children. These people are the foundation of our economy. And they know, you know, we know, that through the strength of our common endeavour, we achieve more than we achieve alone. We know that the real answer to growth isn't uh, tax cuts for the wealthy or uncapping bankers' bonuses. It's not slashing environmental protections and building luxury housing all over the green belt. It is backing our people in every part of the country. And you know, I've been an MP now for 12 years, Wigan's MP. And the people who taught me this most of all were mums who had children with special educational needs, who've been a regular feature in my constituency surgeries over the last 12 years. Without exception, 
those mums, regardless of confidence levels, educational background, um, financial circumstance, or levels of expertise, they have become experts in the opaque systems that surround their children. They never give up. They never take no for an answer. They have taught me that when people have a stake in the outcome and skin in the game, they work harder, they do more, they think more creatively, and they try for longer because they can do no other. But too often, they find the system that works against them, well, we're going to change that. So that people who are in it for the long haul, who are trying to invest and create in our communities, are going to feel the whole system pulling right in behind them. And it's already happening. It's happening in every part of Britain. It's Look at Carbon Co-op, which is retrofitting homes out across the country, long before we pledged that we were going to come in as the next Labour government and give them our, our backing. That's what they were doing because they knew it needed to be done. Repowering London, who develop community-owned renewable energy projects and build community skills and jobs. They knew before we gave it our backing that this is the way that you get money back into people's pockets and pride and purpose and rebuild local communities. There's so much amazing work going on across this country, but people are doing it despite their government. Now imagine what we could do with a government that could match the level of ambition that is found in every family and every community across this country. Well, that is what we're going to do. Three years ago, I said we had a mountain to climb in order to win the next election. Well, we've climbed it. We've proven that we are fit to govern. And last week at our conference, Keir and Rachel and Angela set out plans that show that we're not just fit to govern, we are ready to govern and to rebuild this country. And I want to say to you that as we go about rebuilding this country, every single one of you will be needed this is a call to arms. We are calling forward a generation to respond to the great crises of our age. The next Labour government will usher in a great rebalancing of power with wealth, security and opportunity spread across the country. We're going to invest to bring those clean energy jobs to Britain. We're going to rebuild our social housing stock. I said to conference this year, there will be one mantra, council housing, council housing, council housing. <laughs> We're going to tilt the balance of power back towards people who are renting, giving people the right to make decisions about the homes that they live in and end no-fault evictions because nobody should ever be only a few weeks ago from losing the home that they love. And we're going to empower our brilliant local leaders with new powers to drive growth in every part of Britain. Last time I was in Leeds, I was on a bus with Keir Starmer, Andy Burnham, Steve Rotherham, uh, uh, Jamie Driscoll, and all of the Metro mayors. And we were being regaled by Tracy Brabin about the amazing work that she's done, bringing uh, carbon neutral transport at affordable cost to people in Leeds. And a row broke out between these mayors about who had better buses. I said to Andy Burnham, Andy, where's our two pound fare? And he said, it's coming, it's coming. And when Keir and I left them, he said to me, do you think they're just gonna keep going round and round on this bus, <laughs> arguing about it? For all I know, they may be there still. But imagine what people like Tracy could do with real powers over transport, over skills, over all of the things that you need in order to grow your economy and get things working again. We will hand them those powers, but we'll do more than that. As the amazing Alex Norris, the Shadow Minister for Leveling Up, has fought for all his life and he's now going to deliver in government, we are going to push power beyond politicians to our people. That's why we're going to introduce a powerful new community right to buy so that communities have not just first refusal when the pubs and the historic buildings, the football clubs, the live music venues, those institutions that help to shape and define us as we shape and define them come up for sale. But we're going to make sure that you have the means to buy them as well. Now, I've seen in action what this means. In Hendon, in Sunderland, I went with Julie Elliott recently to meet a group of residents who had watched as private landlords had bought up their village. Um, the housing stock left to go to rack and ruin, pushing up rents, running down the community. 
and with a grant from a scheme introduced by the last Labour government, one of the last to be handed out before the Tories axed it, they had taken back control, literally, by buying out properties to let out at reasonable rates and in good condition to local families. It's allowed them to use that revenue to start to invest again in the community, in the people of the community and in the fabric. So we met in this beautiful historic library that had become derelict, that is now back in use and was bustling in the centre of the town. They call themselves back on the map in recognition of how much they have, have achieved, but how much they still have to offer. But we know, as they know, that rights on paper don't always translate into meaningful change. Just because you have the right to buy your local football club, as we found when Wigan Athletic was plunged into administration, it doesn't mean that you can. We were told, of course you've got the right to buy it, as long as you can find a cool 16 million down the back of the sofa. Well, of course we couldn't. So we're going to double the length of time that communities have to raise money to buy local assets and we're going to build on the community ownership fund to make sure that every community has not just a fund to draw on but the ability to generate revenue for the community as well. We've got a commission working on this led by the amazing Mark Gregory, the former chief economist at Ernst & Young, and he's working with people in this room on how we're going to make that a reality. This is the first step on the road to financial autonomy for our great towns, cities and villages right across this country because we believe in our places and we believe in the people in them and the next Labour government is going to go out and fight for them and back them as they rebuild this country. Now I want to leave you with this thought that the theme of this conference is from crisis to cooperation and that couldn't be more appropriate for this moment. We're in a time of huge upheaval where many people across this country are lying awake at night wondering what is going to happen to their children, to their homes, to their parents, to their businesses and to their communities. And I want to say to you that cooperation isn't just a route out of this crisis, it is the only route out of this crisis. It's tempting at times like this to try and play it safe. I want to say to you that is not who we are. In the 1945, out of the devastation of the Second World War, when people were returning home, having fought that war at great personal cost, huge swathes of people across the country saying, we will not return to the squalor that we were forced to live in and endure before. The Attlee government rose to that moment. They brought huge numbers of public goods in, back into common ownership. But more than that, they built more council housing than any other government in history. That's how you rise to the challenge. And then in the 1970s, the Wilson government stepped forward because we had a settlement where women, immigrant communities, working class families had ambitions that far outstripped the opportunities were on offer. And what did they do? They rose to the moment with the Race Relations Act and the Equal Pay Act and Comprehensive Education. And then 1997, when globalisation was threatening the future of, of young people in Britain, and what, what did Tony Blair and the new Labour team do? They stepped forward with education, 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 rebuilt our crumbling schools and hospitals, got money back into people's pockets for amazing innovations like the national minimum wage, the education maintenance allowance, Sure Start, aim higher, put it together, and you had a package that lifted young people up for the first time in their lives and allowed them to live the richer, larger lives that every single person deserves. That's why I say that we've got to rise to this moment together, only together. By coming together with central government, local government, communities, people, businesses, trade unions and cooperative societies. That's the only way that we're going to build the better country that we know we can be. The Co-op Party and Labour share a close bond. Our partnership is now nearly a century old. It's based on a long history of shared values and principles and through good times and bad, we've stood together, we've fought together and we've won together. But this isn't about our history, it's about our future, our shared future, because none of us can do it alone. We can rise to this moment and we will to meet this crisis in a great national mission to rebuild our country. The country that I've believed in all of my life, but never quite yet seen. I didn't join the Labour Party because I hate the Tories, although by God, they're making it easy right now. <laughs> I joined the Labour Party because I know that we can build that country. 
and we're going to do it the only way that counts together. Thank you very much, uh, Lisa, uh, for that glimpse into that shared future, that glimpse of uh, what the country can be rather than what it is. That was fantastic. Thank you, Lisa, uh, for your contribution and, and kicking off our conference today. Friends, uh, we are absolutely uh, overwhelmed. We're delighted and honoured. Uh, over the recent times, we've seen what a fantastic chancellor our next speaker will make. She is a champion of the labour and cooperative movement. We're delighted to have her here today. I want you to give her a, a very warm welcome in our home city, Rachel Reeves. Uh, thank you very much for that, um, that introduction and also for the opportunity to speak at this important time. And as Abigail said, welcome to, to this fantastic city, the city of Leeds. The theme of your annual conference this year is from crisis to cooperation. And after 12 years of Conservative governments, we certainly have plenty of crises facing our country. A climate crisis and an energy crisis an economic crisis and a cost of living crisis. An NHS no longer experiencing just a winter crisis, but a spring, a summer and an autumn crisis too. It isn't just that the Conservatives aren't up to the task of responding to these crises, it's that it is their choices are actively making them worse. The charge against this government is not just that they are incompetent, which they clearly are, but it's now a bigger question. It's about priorities, it's about values, and it's about who our government and our country is run for. The Conservatives have made it clear who they are not working for. Their trickle-down economic theory is discredited and it is deeply divisive. It's not a theory of growth, it's a political excuse to disregard the interests of the overwhelming majority of the British people. It's the politics of know your place. The Tories believe that the interests of ordinary working people and decent standards for the environment, whether it's working hours, the cleanliness of our rivers and our seas, are irrelevant to our economy. Liz Truss's government goes further now and argues that hard-won rights and standards are impediments to be weakened, devalued, and even sacrificed. That's not Labour's vision of Britain, and we will fight it every step of the way. The Tories do not believe that the tax system should be used to create opportunities or to meet the obligations for society as a whole. Instead, their approach is to help the richest in society to become even richer. Now, they may have re u turn for now on abolishing the top rate of income tax for those earning £150,000. But we have seen their desire. We have seen their instincts. They will come back to it in the future and we will fight it every step of the way. Mm -hmm. and <laughs> and what is it all for? We know that tax giveaways for the very wealthiest of people and the largest corporations don't reach the millions of people across the country who are finding it harder to get by day by day. They certainly have never reached the families living in the 26 tower blocks in my constituency of Leeds West, just a mile down the road. They don't feel the trickle down of this Conservative government. We in this room as Labour and cooperators know the truth that growth comes from the efforts of millions of working people and thousands of businesses, from the bottom up and from the middle out. We know that a smart, active government is key to ensuring a stronger economy where we all can prosper. In creating new markets and tackling the biggest issues of the day, from climate change to inequality, working in partnership, government, community and business. And the Conservatives out of step now with so many businesses 
in our communities too. The head of the CBI, Tony Danker, said that the corporation tax cuts wouldn't feature in his top 30 measures to promote economic growth. And yet the Tories pursue it. The Tory approach to the economy doesn't work and it won't reward the millions of people and the hundreds of thousands of businesses who help create the wealth of our country every single day. The Tories just do not get it, which is why the last Labour government had levels of economic growth that this Tory government can only dream of. The Conservatives are out of control and they don't care who they drag down with them or harm in their ideological cause. We've heard from the Deputy Governor of the Bank of England just this last week to confirm that this current economic crisis is a consequence of the Conservatives' mini-budget two weeks ago. Not that government ministers are in any mood to listen. They show contempt for any institution which provides challenge, scrutiny, or a dose of reality. And it is ordinary people who pay the price for this. The failure to publish the Office for Budget Responsibilities assessment of our economy alongside that recent mini budget was an arrogant attempt to conceal the damage that the Tories have done to our economy and to hide how reckless the measures in that fiscal statement were. Now, yesterday, the Chancellor received an updated forecast from the Office for Budget Responsibility. We've called for those documents to be published in full, but the Tories refuse. What is everyone to conclude? They think that everyone else is stupid. You wouldn't buy a house from an owner who denied you the right to see the structural survey, or buy a second-hand car from someone who repeatedly refused to say whether it passed its recent MOT or not. Yet they expect the public and financial markets to just accept that paying for permanent, unfunded tax cuts with colossal sums of government borrowing, borrowing on the backs of current and future taxpayers, is all fine. Nothing to worry about. Nothing to see here. The Tories have crashed our economy with their budget. And now millions of people will not be able to afford as Lisa has said this morning, the soaring interest rates as a result of this government's devastating economic decisions. The Conservatives haven't produced a plan for growth. They have unleashed a strategy for sleepless nights. We've seen major building societies and banks suddenly withdraw a range of products, hundreds of projects, as they see the direction the Conservatives are taking the economy in. There are 1.8 million people who are due to come off fixed rate mortgage products by the end of 2023. Labour's analysis shows that the average UK homeowner coming off a two year fixed rate deal onto a 6% mortgage rate product will now have to pay an average of £500 more every single month. Most people do not have that sort of money to spare. What does the government think that they should do? They say it means working even more hours, less time with a family. But for many, there aren't any more hours left in the day. No savings for the future, less to spend and less time with your family. For others, it means missing holidays and changing big life choices. Not because mistakes that they or their families have made, but because of the mistakes that this conservative government has made. Household debt is up, repossessions up, and sucking huge sums out of the economy with all the negative consequences that has for communities and for businesses too. And it won't be just those with mortgages who will pay for conservative mistakes. Many buy-to-let landlords paying an even higher rate will look to their tenants to meet the shortfall with even higher rates and rents. This government, through its warped priorities, its refusal to listen, and historic levels of sheer incompetence is turning a cost of living crisis into a housing crisis. 
It is unacceptable, it is unsustainable, and it is unforgivable. And Labour will do everything we can to reverse this Tory budget. Now, whilst the Conservative Party conference, and who's enjoyed the Conservative Party conference this week? Whilst the Conservative Party conference was marred by division and desperate late night U-turns, Labour used our conference to set out a positive plan for the future, a party ready to show the leadership that our country so desperately needs. We will stabilise the economy by being responsible with public finances through our strong fiscal rules. And on that foundation, we have the Green Prosperity Plan to invest in the jobs and the industries of tomorrow as we meet our climate obligations and pass on to our children and grandchildren a greener and a fairer planet. We know that the costs of climate inaction aren't just devastating for our planet, but they will harm our economy and increasingly destabilise everyday lives too. That is why Labour will work in partnership with Britain's industries to invest in solar, in wind, in hydrogen and in nuclear power too creating good jobs and opportunities, as well as to pass on to our children, a fairer and a greener country. Businesses with all models of ownership should play their full role in this national endeavor. Labour will create a national wealth fund so that the public has a stake and gets a return on those investments. So when they succeed, so does the whole country. It's not just about ensuring good value for taxpayers. It's an important principle that the public deserve to benefit from a growing economy. Had Thatcher's Tories given any regard to our common interest with the profits of North Sea oil in the 1980s, like Norway did, then Britain would be a far richer and far more equal society today. We will ensure that Britain is more secure in our energy generation and supply, which is why Keir Starmer announced at our conference that we would create GB Energy, publicly owned and working in our national interest. <laughs> Labour's Green Prosperity Plan is the antidote to the Tories' record of low growth and flat wages. It will breathe life into many former industrial industrialised towns and coastal communities. But our economic ambitions don't stop there. So I will be a responsible Chancellor and I will be Britain's first Green Chancellor. <laughs> Let me give you another example. Since I became Shadow Chancellor, I've been listening to businesses of all shapes and sizes in every part of the United Kingdom. I'm working with the co-op party and the co-op movement on our high streets commission, exploring how to revive our high streets in our towns and our cities. The one priority that kept coming up time and time again was the need to address the unfairness of an outdated model of business rates. This dated tax regime holds back bricks and mortar businesses at the heart of our communities. Meanwhile, it makes it easier for online retailers who have their warehouses located on cheaper areas of land. It's not fair, it's not sustainable, that high street businesses should pay over a third of business rates, yet make up less than 15% of the overall economy. So Labour will scrap the model of outdated business rates and replace it with a fairer form of business property taxation. Yeah. And we will ensure that the big online retailers pay their fair share through fair taxation of multinationals and global tech businesses. Because if you can afford to fly to space, you can afford to pay your taxes here on planet Earth. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We will level the playing field and give a significant boost to high street retailers, including our important co-ops too. Now, Johnny Reynolds will ensure that we have an industrial strategy in, for all sectors of our economy, but including for our everyday economy, including retail. 
because this important sector has been neglected for far too long. I know that cooperative retailers will want to play their full part in this work too. And as Lisa Nandy has set out this morning, we will help ensure that communities have more say over their high streets, giving real power to people over the places that they call home. Working people work hard for their money and they deserve to be treated fairly. Yet too often there is a double standard embedded in our tax system with loopholes and privileges that reward those who already have the most. Labour is the party of tax fairness, knowing that this is vital for a strong economy and for strong public services as well. So in government, Labour will ensure that the tax system works for ordinary people in our country. We will crack down on tax havens, on offshore trusts, and strengthen the rules in the UK, which have allowed the oligarchs to hide their wealth here and launder the murky sources of it too. Labour supports a strong global minimum rate of corporation tax, working with our international allies like President Biden to stop homegrown businesses being undercut so badly by multinationals located for tax purposes in tax havens. But while ordinary people and businesses contribute to our economy and support our public services, there is another group who have been allowed to opt out of their tax obligations here in Britain, and that is the non-DOMs. Labour believes that if you make Britain your home, you should pay your taxes here. And that is why, as Chancellor in the next Labour government, we will abolish the non-DOM tax status. <laughs> it's unjustified, it's unfair, and new research from the University of Warwick shows that it would raise £3.2 billion every year. Labour will use that money from non-DOMs to fund the expansion of our NHS workforce with more doctors, more nurses, more midwives, more district nurses, and more health visitors too. It's about fairness, it's about priorities, and it's about whose side you are on. We will be challenging the Conservatives to do what is right for taxpayers and end this outrageous arcane loophole exploited by the super-rich. Let them defend the indefensible, but under Labour, non-DOM tax status will go. Our vision is of a stronger, greener economy and a fairer society as well. We will deal with the crises our country faces firmly in the collective interest. Now is the time for new ideas and solutions to emerge in the interests of the many. If necessity is the mother of invention, then it is the father of cooperation too. The cooperative movement emerged at a time of economic hardship and crisis for ordinary people. It was in 1847, here in Leeds, amidst economic depression and high costs of corn, that local people formed a cooperative. It would take over Britannia Mill and then build a people's mill, which lowered flour prices for people across our city. Within 15 years, the Leeds Cooperative Flour and Provision Society became the biggest cooperative in the country. Lancashire may have had the first, but Yorkshire had the biggest. Oh, <laughs> 175 years later, cooperatives are playing an important role to our national economy, contributing £40 billion every year. From retail and finance to home care to supporting cultural industries. As research from Cooperatives UK has shown, 81% of UK cooperatives are in our everyday economy, and that increases to 97% of all jobs in the UK cooperative sector. They are a source of resilience too, and were five times less likely to cease trading in 2021 than other businesses, with the gender pay gap in cooperatives narrower too. Cooperatives are a great example of how businesses can work to the benefit of both the company, the workers and our communities. That is why the Labour Party and the Co-op Party 
has an agreed and important ambition for government. Our aim is to double the size of the cooperative sector in the UK. It won't be easy, it won't happen overnight. It is an important goal and we will achieve it together. The choices that our country face are increasingly stark. And it's not just a choice of policies. It is two different visions for our economy and for our society. Failed trickle-down economics with the Tories, or a stronger and a fairer economy with Labour. A government that pursues division, or one that realises our shared ambitions. The Tories have lost control of our economy. They've lost economic credibility. They are a dying government. And now we need a Labour government, led by Keir Starmer and supported by millions of people in all walks of life to create the stronger, greener and fairer economy that the people of Britain deserve. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much.